My name is Dr. James B. Harris. I am a surgical oncologist at Western Surgical Group, which is a multidisciplinary surgical group in Reno, Nevada. We serve the greater portion of Northern Nevada and Western Nevada and parts of California. I'm also cur uh, currently the uh, professor of surgery at the University of Nevada at Reno Medical School, and I'm the former chief of surgery. I'm currently the medical director of oncology services at Renown Health, the largest uh, hospital in the area. I am the current state chair for Nevada for the American College of Surgeons. And I'm also the current chair of accreditation and all standard um, evaluations for the Commission on Cancer. My practice focuses on the surgical treatment of skin cancer and melanoma. It is my pleasure to give this lecture today uh, on skin cancer and melanoma. May is the month that we focus on the prevention uh, screening and treatment of melanoma, and I appreciate the opportunity provided by the Nevada Cancer Coalition, the uh, University of, of Nevada at Reno, and Renowned Health to offer this program. Skin cancer is the most common form of cancer that we see, uh, and is more common than all other cancers combined. One out of every five Americans will have some form of skin cancer during their lifetime. It is important to realize that the incidence of skin cancer is continuing to increase. Most skin cancers are related in some fashion to electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the typical one that we think of is the ultraviolet rays, which are just above the uh, visible light spectrum and the EMR spectrum. But there's also electromagnetic radiation that comes from the earth and also sometimes radiation that we as providers uh, give to patients through radiation treatments in medicine. It is the wavelength of the ultraviolet area of the spectrum of the EMR that is particularly interesting and in that it interacts with the DNA, particularly at the surface of the skin. So most of the uh, ultraviolet radiation that we do see comes from the sun. It usually is described in three wavelengths, UVA, B, and C. We don't hear much about UVC as this is typically absorbed by the ozone layer of the Earth's atmosphere. Those areas where there may be a lack of ozone, such as over Australia, sometimes this type of, of ultraviolet light can be more problematic. Particularly, we're talking about UVA and UVB uh, ultraviolet radiation. UVB is partially absorbed by the ozone and less gets through to the uh, surface of the Earth, whereas UVA is only uh, minimally absorbed by the ozone. So it does interact with our skin and the skin has many functions. The most primary one that we all think of is it's a barrier between our inside of you know, you know, living structures and the outside world. So certainly it provides a protective barrier. But the skin also has other functions that are important to know when you're talking about uh, cancer of the skin. Um, there is, it is usually broken up into epidermis, the very superficial layer and the dermis, which is a little deeper part of the skin. And then below that will be your subcutaneous tissue. In that uh, dermal layer, we have uh, blood vessels, we have sweat glands, there are hair follicles, uh, there are neuroreceptors for touch. So there are many different functions the skin actually has. And the very surface of the skin, the epidermis, has many layers. There are usually five layers, starting at the very bottom, the basal layer. And this is where the keratinocytes uh, begin and slowly migrate up into the upper uh, layers of the skin and become more of the squamous cells and they get cornified and dried out and come to the surface of our skin. Depending upon where a tumor may uh, occur in that epidermis determines the type of histology of the cancer. Certainly, if it occurs in the melanocytes and the basal layer, we call that melanoma. If it occurs in the basal cells, it's called basal cell carcinoma. If it occurs in the squamous uh, areas above that, it's called squamous cell carcinoma. So again, our anatomy is important here. Here I've defined uh, the uh, four major layers before the superficial uh, desquamated area of skin. And here we see the stratum basale or the basal cell layer. And in that are the keratinocytes that are the formation of all of our skin cells. Interspersed amongst those basal cells are uh, melanocytes. Now melanocytes are the cell from which a melanoma can form. Inside the melanocyte, there is a substance called uh, melanosoma. And this is basically there to help absorb harmful wavelengths of radiation. When your, sun is when your skin is exposed to radiation, the melanocytes absorb that radiation and it induces uh, more production of melanosoma. Now the production of melanosoma varies greatly by race and by uh, different uh, skin tones. 
So again, we did talk, just talk a little bit earlier about the penetration of the skin by UVA and UVB. Here you can see that UVA penetrates all layers of the skin, not only the epidermis and dermis, but down to the subtase tissue. And UVB only partially gets into the epidermis and dermis. That's important because the different layers of damage that can be caused by that UV radiation um, is significant. So it's UVA, gets down to the area of the septic tissue and the collagen layer. And that's what ends up causing damage to that area and causes wrinkling as we get older. Whereas the UVB typically causes more interaction at the upper layers, the epidermis and dermis. So when the UV radiation does interact with our skin cells, one of the places that that small wavelength interacts the best with is the DNA strands. And sometimes this will cause a break in the DNA strand, either a single strand break or sometimes a double strand break. Now, most of these times, this will cause a mutation that is basically not survivable, but sometimes those mutations can uh, live on and cause problems. The other type of radiation uh, damage that can occur is when radiation hits two thymine uh, base pairs together and causes them to uh, come together as a dimer, causing a kink in the DNA. Again, that can cause the uh, wrong protein to be formed uh, when DNA is read. So again, these mutations, they occur, as I said, most of them are going to be deleterious and the cell will die. But those that actually can survive may carry on new uh, properties. Now, the initial uh, strand, when it's red, will have a, a correct copy and an incorrect copy, and that can then be passed on to future generations. So let's talk about some of the common skin disorders before we get into skin cancer itself. Some of the ones that we commonly will see in our practice are freckles, keratosis, and moles. Now, freckles, sometimes called ethylese, are when normal melanocytes overproduce melanin granules. Um, so this is a very common skin disorder it's seen in a large number of patients, and there's not a, a problem whatsoever. Actinic keratoses, or sometimes they're called solar keratoses, um, also affect about 58 million people. These are ir uh, irregularities in the superficial aspects of the skin. Typically, this is on the skin of the face and the temple area. And these can be a very problematic uh, requiring medical care. And there's important to remember, these can be precursors to squamous cell cancers later in life. Now, moles will be uh, something that we'll be dealing with a lot in our practice. Moles are when melanocytes grow in a group. <clears throat> Rather than spreading out like, uh, like a freckle, they kind of grow in a group together. And then when they're exposed to sun, they can darken. And that makes the common appearance of the mole or nevus, as it's otherwise called. Typically, we break um, nevi into two uh, categories. There is benign nevi, which are characterized by smooth borders, uniform color, a symmetric shape, and a size less than six millimeters, which we normally say is about the size of a eraser on the top of a pencil. And this picture shows what a typical benign uh, nevi would look like. A dysplastic nevi, on the other hand, would have an irregular border. It would have variation in color. Sometimes there would be asymmetry, so if you took a line down the middle of that lesion and tried to fold it over, it wouldn't fold over nicely like it would in a benign nevi. And typically, these are larger than six millimeters. It is these dysplastic nevi that are the most concerned to dermatologists, and any kind of change in a dysplastic nevi uh, over time would warrant recommendations for a biopsy. So let's talk a bit more about skin cancers. The type of skin cancer that we'll go over today will be a basal cell carcinoma, a squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, and we'll just touch on Merkel cell carcinoma, which is a more unusual type of cancer. So basal cell cancers are the most common of the skin cancers. Uh, they basically are very slow growing. Uh, about 75% of these are usually on the face. And most times, basal cell carcinomas are relatively benign. Uh, if left untreated, they can become disfiguring and life-threatening, but that's relatively rare. They typically occur in two forms. There's a typical flat form, which is seen in this uh, picture on the left, and the nodular form on the right. Oftentimes, if left untreated, they will get a ulceration in the center, and it will be a lesion that just does never heal. Um, you feel that maybe it's just a, a, a problem with like a small skin eruption, and you treat it, and it comes back, and you treat it, and it comes back, and never quite heal. That's very typical of a basal cell carcinoma. So the treatment for basal cell carcinomas is relatively straightforward. Negative margins is the goal. Simple excision to get those negative margins is usually all that's required. It's rare that you have a larger tumor, but if you did, sometimes it's important to remove fat, fascia, ligament, and even bone sometimes. And sometimes plastic surgery can be, um, closure can be needed. But again, that's on the rare side. Um, again, these type of tumors rarely involve lymph nodes, and therefore, silt nodes are not usually recommended 
The other type of skin cancer that you often will hear about is squamous cell carcinoma. This type of cancer is about twice as uh, frequently seen in men than women. It typically occurs in the older age groups above 50 and oftentimes can arise in areas of chronic inflammation, particularly in, in areas like a burns or actinic keratotic lesions. There's a name of an ulcer called a margins ulcer, which is oftentimes seen uh, after a burn many, many years later in that, that high, uh, inflammatory tissue. And that's very classically a uh, squamous cell carcinoma. They have a little different appearance. They basically have a kind of a rolled up, uh, they call pearl colored edges uh, type appearance with central ulceration. And here we see two good examples of what a squamous cell carcinoma could look like. We here is one on the hand and one on the uh, face. But it is important to remember that nothing is as perfect as the textbook. They come in all shapes and uh, presentations. Here's a very unusual kind of uh, diffuse squamous cell carcinoma noted on an extremity. And again, this could be easily missed for a bruise or some other type of abnormality. So like basal cell carcinomas, the treatment of squamous cell carcinomas is to get negative margins after a surgical excision. So again, we can usually do that with attempt at primary closure. Sometimes it's necessary to do a skin graft if the lesion is much larger. Squamous cell cancers have a pretty oh, a higher, but still not, not extremely high incidence of lymph node value, uh, spreading. Um, and metastasis systemically is relatively rare. We only consider lymph node, like a central node biopsy for squamous cell carcinomas if they're a larger lesion or if they have a palpable uh, node in the basin that drains that area of the, of the squamous cell cancer, sometimes we'll actually do a node dissection. But again, I will uh, do want to reiterate that that's relatively rare. Now, there are other forms besides surgery for basal cell and squamous cell cancers. And I've listed a few of those here. Uh, certainly radiation, chemotherapy, photodynamic therapy, biologic therapy and immunotherapies have all been used for treatment of this type of cancer. And just briefly to touch on this last one, immunotherapy, when a patient has a squamous cell cancer that is either metastatic or not thought to be surgically resectable, we recently have had the uh, development of some immunotherapy medications for both basal cells and squamous cells that have been very, very successful. I have listed several of those here. Now, radiation treatment for skin cancer is often used for uh, either large areas of uh, either basal or squamous cell cancers, or um, sometimes they're in a location where surgery would be difficult to perform. And radiation can be treated, um, can be used for treatment. And here we can see some before and after uh, pictures of patients that had either uh, more diffuse forms of basal cells and squamous cell cancers and the dramatic improvement that you see uh, from that. Um, it is interesting to, that we would use radiation, which is oftentimes thought to be the cause of cancers as a form of treatment. There are also topical therapies that uh, most of you are well aware of. The first one that you see down here on the left-hand side is called Effudex. That is topical 5-FU, which is, uh, helps intercalate into the DNA and stops DNA replication. And that's oftentimes used for a topical medication for actinic keratoses and basal cells and squamous cells. We also have Aldara or Imiquimod, which is a biologic therapy. Imiquimod is an interesting medication in that we believe that it interacts with the antigen-presenting cells or Langerhans cells, which then take the medication and migrate to a local lymph node and then activate the adaptive immune system. Uh, this sometimes will have a down uh, regulation uh, or excuse me, a down a stream uh, enhancement of the receptors of the immune system to secrete cytokines such as interferon alpha, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis uh, factor. Mainly we use imiquimod uh, to treat things like superficial basal cell cancers, actinic keratoses, and genital warts. Now, I did mention briefly Merkel cell carcinoma. This is an interesting type of skin cancer. It is associated with the, the cells that form the tactile proprioception we have in our skin. It's a rare aggressive skin cancer and oftentimes appears as a flesh colored or a reddish bluish lesion. It is commonly seen in elderly patients or in those patients that have a weakened immune system. It again is of neuroendocrine origin. It is associated with relatively early systemic spread, which is why it has a more aggressive uh, nature to it. And it is treated pretty uh, similarly to melanoma. So again, um, it is a tumor of the uh, tactile mechanical receptor in the skin. And these Merkel discs, uh, Merkel discs are what, where the cells arise and will form this kind of raised up reddish uh, bluish appearing lesion in the skin.
So let's spend the rest of our time on melanoma because that is the uh, tumor that is uh, the one that has the uh, greatest fear associated with it. Uh, again, we do see a rising incidence of melanoma here in Northern Nevada. And the top graph does show that over the last decade, there's been an increasing risk of the incidence of, mel of melanoma. Uh, it is interesting that this is a high altitude uh, region and we have a less uh, protection of the atmosphere from the UV from the sun. We also have a lot more uh, outdoor activities with skiing, hiking, and boating activities. So certainly we're in an area where melanoma would be frequent. It is interesting to note in the lower graph that uh, about 30% of our patients are diagnosed at a later stage, stage three and four. So it is important to realize that screening for melanoma is still very, very important to try to make the, as many patients that have an earlier stage at diagnosis as possible. About 35% about of our patients are diagnosed at stage one. 2% of all skin cancers uh, are basically what make up melanoma. So it's a pretty much a rare form of skin cancer, but it's interesting that it makes up the majority of the deaths. It is the fifth most common cancer of all cancers in the United States. So we historically have divided melanoma into histologic subtypes. Superficial spreading, which is the flat, more, uh, more flat-like melanoma, nodular melanoma, acral lentiginous melanoma, and lenticular maligna. Now, these forms of, uh, or subtypes of melanoma had never been prognostic. They really are just uh, histologic subtypes. And we have not really used them to factor into our staging to determine what type of treatment a patient should get. More recently with the uh, human genome uh, sequencing, we have uh, began to subclassify melanomas into their genomic classifications. And it turns out that if you look at the mutations that occur in melanoma, about 52% of them will have a BRAF mutation about 28% of them will have a KRAS mutation, 14% of them will have a NF1 mutation, and the rest will be a triple wild type, which I've demonstrated those uh, names here. So it is interesting to find out that the areas of the body that have less sun exposure typically will be melanomas that have BRAF mutations. Those that have chronically exposed sun exposure typically have a KRAS mutation. And the more rare tumors of melanoma, such as acral, antigenous, and mucosal melanomas that are thought to be unrelated to sun exposure, carry other mutations, such as the CKIT mutation. Now, although we have not used these subclassifications to help us with staging, it is very helpful, however, for treatment recommendations, because each of these mutations has a targeted, um, a medic or targeted uh, medication that will assist us with treating that type of medication, that type of tumor, excuse me. So what do they look like? Here is what a superficial spreading uh, melanoma, which is the vast majority of melanomas that we see. As you can see, there is an irregular uh, growth pattern. The margins are irregular. The coloration throughout it's not homogeneous. It's very uh, irregular. Um, and sometimes they'll have a little raised up characteristic to them too, as you see in the chest of this uh, patient. Now, nodular melanomas are exactly like they sound. They have more of a nodular appearance. Sometimes they'll be confused with a blood blister or some type of, uh, type of a, a skin injury. Lentical malignant melanomas are typically found on the face. These are commonly in situ and non-invasive melanomas, although not always, but typically they are. And unlike the other melanomas, these type of melanomas typically kind of spread outwards. So sometimes you'll have uh, difficulty in getting clear margins on an excision of the lentical malignant melanoma. The other types of melanoma typically go downward and go down into the subcutaneous tissue and into the lymphatics, and that's where they cause their problem. Acral indigenous melanomas are the ones that are very rare, but they're interesting because they do tend to occur on the palms and soles uh, of the feet where you wouldn't normally think of there being much sun exposure. And they can also occur behind the nails uh, in the nail bed, as you see in this picture here. There are other unusual presentations of melanoma. On the left-hand side, I have a picture of satellite ptosis. This is an unusual presentation of melanoma where there's not just one central lesion, but multiple, sometimes dozens to 100 different small foci of melanoma that occur in the lymphatics close to where the primary tumor uh, began. It's oftentimes will be uh, a type of uh, recurrence of melanoma where once a melanoma has been excised and not, not with clear margins, you oftentimes you'll get a satellite ptosis presentation after that recurrence. Another type of recurrence, another type of uh, presentation is what they call an intransit metastasis. This is where the melanoma cells get into the lymphatics as they spread from where the primary melanoma started going to the first nodal basin. They may stop along the way and start growing into a tumor, and that's called an intransit metastasis because it's actually intransit to that lymph node basin. So very unusual presentations, but also very uh, interesting.
when we as physicians uh, see patients with those moles, we typically are looking for, as I said, a, a change in a dysplastic lesion particularly. So we're looking at the ABCDs of moles. We wanna look at the asymmetry of the, uh, of the mole. We want to look at the border and see if there's any irregularity to the border. We're looking at variation of color throughout that lesion. And we're looking to see if the diameter is larger than the head of a pencil eraser or is evolving over time to get larger. So the, the dermatologist will look at those moles and either with a magnifying glass or dermatoscope, try to further characterize the typical uh, lesion. Sometimes they'll do a skin chart or take photographs to uh, value a lesion and follow it over time to see whether it's evolving through any of those ABCDs that we talked about for melanoma. Typical treatments um, for uh, skin lesions and not just skin cancer, but the, to, to make the diagnosis of cancer are the following. We can do a shave excision. We can do a punch biopsy. We can do a simple excision. We can do electrodesiccation where we just burn it. We can do freezing therapy. We can use most uh, surgery if we do find a cancer and try to get uh, to a negative margin. We can use laser surgery or we can do dermabrasion. We'll talk about a few of the more common ones. The most common one that we'll see from dermatology is a shave biopsy. Here, the lesion is elevated uh, either with some uh, lidocaine and then uh, forceps, and then a scalp is used to shave off the lesion from the uh, underlying dermis and subcutaneous tissue. This has the advantage in that you leave the hair follicles beneath the epidermal layer. And so these type of uh, wounds typically will heal by themselves because this keratinocytes will come out of the hair follicles and then repopulate the area that you took off. So shave biopsy is a very common way to, diagnose, to uh, biopsy skin lesions. The dermatologists particularly like this approach because it evaluates a further area of the uh, lesion rather than doing a smaller uh, biopsy. The other type of biopsy, which is also done quite frequently, is a punch biopsy. In this situation, this device here on the left is actually a circular uh, scalpel, and it's used to uh, incise the area of the skin down into the subcutaneous tissue. It'll obtain a piece of the epidermis, dermis, and the subcutaneous fat. And the reason that is helpful, because that gives us a true depth of the lesion. So if this turns out to be a melanoma, then I can actually determine how deep that melanoma goes into the uh, skin or subcutaneous tissue. And that has a lot of prognost prognostic indications, as well as uh, helping me decide how wide an excision I need to do. So punch biopsies are uh, very highly preferred. Again, we can do something that's called an excisional biopsy, where if the lesion is small enough, and we aren't sure it's cancer, we can basically take the lesion out with a minimal amount of normal skin around it, trying not to leave positive margins. And here we'd make that into a little bit of an ellipse on the face, so it's gonna be easier to close. We can also do incisional biopsies if the lesion's too large, and we take just a small snippet of the lesion, and that way get the diagnosis before we do anything more radical. So how do we treat melanoma? Well, in order to treat melanoma, we actually uh, need to uh, know the stage of the melanoma and what prognostic factors that may estimate how aggressive that lesion might be, which tells us what the likelihood of the local, uh, which is recurrent area and the cancer site, or regional, which would be our nodal basin, or systemic uh, disease. So when you do characterize uh, patients by different prognostic features, we can sometimes develop a staging mechanism where we can identify what, how well a patient will do? What's their survival going to be? What's their prognosis going to be? If they have really good features, we can call those stage one. And as we progress to worse prognostic features, we'll call those stage two, three, and four. And obviously, as you can see here, as we do identify those prognostic features that are more worrisome, it does decrease the survival. You may want to note the dismal survival at five years for stage three and four melanomas that we see here. So been at five years, we're already down to 20% of our patients being alive at five years. Now that has changed somewhat more recently with the development of immunotherapy, but again, it does show you the ability to stratify patients uh, by different risk factors. And so how do we do that? Well, the American Joint uh, Committee on Cancer, AJCC, has a staging manual, and they update this every so many years to look at every cancer site that we have and look at what prognostic features account for how well a patient might or might not do. We are currently in the eighth um, edition, and in that book, you'll see staging forms like this, and the AJCC basically uses the depth of a tumor for melanoma, whether or not lymph nodes are involved, and whether there's any evidence of metastatic disease as the prognostic features to determine how a patient's um, likely to do. So again, there are T, T means depth of the lesion, N would be the nodes, and M would be metastatic. So the prognostic indicators for melanoma 
are how deep the lesion is on the initial biopsy, whether or not there is ulceration present over the, uh, on the top of the skin of the melanoma at the time of that initial biopsy. Certainly positive nodes would pretend a worse prognosis. Those little black dots that we saw earlier called satellitosis carry a worse prognosis. Patients that have in transit metastasis obviously have worse prognosis because prognosis the tumor is already spread beyond the primary site. And obviously, if you have systemic disease, that also carries a worse prognosis. We take these characteristics, the depth of the lesion, nodal status, and whether or not they have systemic disease, and then classify them together into different stages. Again, we talked a bit about the T stage. That is the depth of the tumor. This was recently revised in the eighth edition. So any tumor that is up to 0.8 millimeters without ulceration will be called a T1A lesion. Those between 0.8 uh, and one millimeter without ulceration or any tumor that is up to one millimeter with ulceration is a T1B. And then T2 would be any tumor that's um, more than uh, two millimeters without ulceration and they're called A and then with ulceration called B. So you can see how we can subtype different uh, even layers uh, levels within levels. And again, we group these together and we come up with uh, recommendations for treatment. Here, I just did a little note that cell nodes would be identified for those patients that are 1B or higher. If they're node positive, they're typically called stage three, and those that are metastatic are called stage four. So I, as a surgeon, have to decide how wide do I go around a melanoma? Well, that excision of the melanoma is gonna be dependent upon the initial biopsy that the dermatologist did. If the patient has an in situ melanoma where it is not invaded beyond the basal layer, I need to get a relatively narrow uh, margin of, of normal tissue around that melanoma. And that could be as low, little as 0.5 uh, centimeters or five millimeters. If I have a T1 lesion or up to one millimeter deep, I want to get a one centimeter margin. If I'm between one and two millimeters deep, I want to get between a one and two centimeter margin around that. If I'm uh, between two and four millimeters deep, I want to get a two centimeter margin. And beyond that, really, there's not much benefit of going much wider than two, two centimeters. So even if you have a greater than four millimeter lesion, which is going to be very deep, it's not necessarily to go much further than two centimeter margin. This still leaves a relatively large defect, as you might expect. Again, this gets to the idea of why are we getting these wider margins? Because we believe that as melanoma uh, goes downward, some of those cells will escape the primary focus and start migrating through the tissue into the lymphatic vessels. And you need to get out wide enough to make sure you incorporate all those cells that might be migrating towards the lymphatic system when you do your, your major resection. So that's the rationale behind doing these radical resections. So again, we do a wide excision of the melanoma. Um, the closure usually tries to be done by a primary closure. Sometimes it's necessary to do a, a split thickness skin graft or a, a flat closure. And if you have a lesion underneath a digit, such as on underneath the fingernails or you know, underneath the toenail, and sometimes even if it involves a portion of the foot or hand, sometimes either a digit uh, may be required to amputation, and sometimes a whole hand or foot could be uh, required to be amputated in order to get uh, the survival benefit. Again, that's relatively unusual. We also look at lymph nodes, because as we said, um, melanomas have a chance to go to lymph nodes, higher chance than either basal cells or squamous cells do. And they do that when they migrate through that different layers of skin into the subcutaneous tissue and they get into lymphatics. So we have to decide, when do we check whether the patient needs a lymph node evaluation to see whether the tumor has spread to the lymph nodes, since that's the most common place it would spread, and when do we not need to do that? So along came cell node um, uh, biopsies. Before we had to do a complete node dissection because we couldn't tell which node we needed to look at, where cell node technology allows us to inject a little bit of radioactivity or blue dye around the primary site. That will then travel to the lymph node basin, usually armpit or in the groin area, and will light up either with radioactivity or a blue dye that lymph node that drains that part of the body where the melanoma was. And it gives us the ability to dis take out just that one or two lymph nodes and leave the rest of them behind so that we don't cause problems with lymphedema and wound healing. And it really allows us to take those nodes out and really study them carefully to see whether or not there's any um, melanoma that's metastasized from the primary site. It's pretty rare nowadays that we do radical node dissections. I'll talk about that in a bit, little bit. So again, the surgical excision may be as simple as defining a ruler around that primary site here on the left and making that one centimeter margin. And as you can see, that makes a circle around the lesion. It's very hard to close a circle. If I turn that incision into an ellipse, like a football, then I can undermine the tissue above and below and mobilize that tissue once I remove the melanoma and pull that tissue back together for a primary closure. Sometimes it's necessary to do either a skin graft or here as a rhomboid flap we see near the ear, where I mobilize some tissue 
from an area of less uh, tightness, uh, more laxity, and rotated that in to fill the defect. Again, we're going to do a lymph node um, evaluation for any melanoma that's deeper than one millimeter, because if we do our studies, we find that lymph node involvement begins to occur when melanomas are about one millimeter or deeper. It's about a three to five percent chance at that level you could have a positive lymph node, and then that incidence rises as the melanoma gets deeper. So starting around one millimeter, with some exceptions, we start thinking about doing cell node biopsy, and here is a picture of dissecting out a blue node at the end of the Kelly forceps there what, uh, that it occurred after we injected the patient with some blue dye near their primary site. So again, this is usually done for those uh, melanomas deeper than one millimeter. There's some exceptions. Those that are between 0.8 and one millimeter deep, if they have poor prognostic features like ulceration, uh, it can be considered. It's not usually performed for patients that have palpable nodes because you don't need that technology. You can remove the node or for stage four where they already have uh, disease beyond the lymph nodes. So what else do we do? We oftentimes, when we uh, get done with our surgery, we need to find out whether or not this tumor has gone beyond the primary site or lymph nodes that we've just evaluated. So the NCCN guidelines suggest that additional staging should be considered for those patients that are stage three or node positive melanoma, or obviously stage four, which is systemic melanoma. Uh, and it should now be considered for stages two B and C, because as of December in 2021, we did increase our recommendations for immunotherapy for even earlier stages of melanoma, such as stage two B and C. Those staging scans are typically a PET CT scan um, for the whole body, as well as an MRI of the brain. And the MRI of the brain is done because usually the PET CT scan is not as accurate in the brain because it uses usually radioactive glucose. The brain uses lots of radioactive, lots of glucose. So sometimes it's hard to see any kind of abnormalities in the brain area. So we supplement that with an MRI of the brain. <clears throat> a CT scan can be performed if the patient for some reason cannot undergo an MRI scan. Otherwise, we don't usually do scans for melanoma uh, for the earlier stages unless the patient has some symptoms that would say it would warrant you to look further for that. So NCCN guidelines don't recommend further staging for earlier stages melanoma. And because of that, oftentimes insurance companies will not pay for it. So you have to be very careful about your ordering scans for early stage melanoma. So again, the treatment melanoma is the patient has a positive cell node or a clinically positive node then obviously we need to do that staging. So we need to get that PET scan, we need to get that brain MRI. If there is no evidence of metastatic disease, um, then and we have that positive node, you could consider doing a node dissection like we did in the past to remove any residual local regional tumor. Um, but the, about three years ago, the MALT-2 trial uh, uh, was mature enough to look at the data. It turns out that there is no overall survival and doing node dissections or completion node dissections for those patients that have positive nodes, it's kind of contrary because they think, boy, if they have one positive node, you know, they could potentially have more positive nodes. But it turns out that there's no survival benefit. And that's probably because of the fact that when you have a positive lymph nodes, there's a much higher chance of systemic spread already. So taking MR lymph nodes is not going to stop that systemic uh, disease from causing problems. So again, at this time, we only uh, do further nodes based on uh, evaluation from multidisciplinary conferences, and we have to weigh the morbidity of doing that node dissection uh, against the benefit. There is some studies that have shown that there's less chance of the cancer coming back in that lymph node basin if you do a completion node dissection, but there are again complications associated with doing those node dissections. And here I just want to show you sometimes in the past when we did these groin radical node dissections, it encompassed a large area of tissue. Here it's showing the orientation of the groin and all of the skin, dermis, subtense fat, and lymphatic tissue was taken out all the way down to the vessel, leaving a very large defect, difficult to close, uh, difficult to heal, and very high chance of lymphedema in the extremity, which can be permanent. So again, you want to balance the benefit of that node dissection against, uh, against the benefit and the risk against it. So what type of systemic treatments do we have for melanoma? Well, uh, we have several now. Uh, up until about 15 years ago, we had nothing. We, we tried lots of things. Chemotherapy didn't seem to be very effective. Radiation therapy didn't seem to be very effective. We tried lots of things like interleukin-2. Interleukin when I was a resident and fellow, uh, patients were treated with really high dose interleukin-2 and were very, very sick, trying to uh, find a way to treat more advanced melanoma and really had very poor uh, effects. It wasn't until about 15 years ago where immunotherapy um, began became introduced and really we began to see some real improvement in the survival and quality of life for those patients with more advanced melanoma. These types of immunotherapy you may have heard about, they're sometimes called immune checkpoint inhibitors. 
adoptive cell therapies, monoclonal antibodies. There's also a therapy called oncolytic virus therapy. There are cancer vaccines that are constantly being evaluated, and there's immune system modulators. So historically, the, um, we started off with interferon. That was our earliest um, systemic treatment for melanoma. Um, very toxic, uh, not well tolerated, not very good results. It wasn't until uh, 2014 when Yervoy or Ipimimilab um, came along that targeted the CTLA-4 antigen. And that was really very uh, groundbreaking as far as the, re the response that these patients had. There are other types of uh, uh, immunotherapies we'll talk about a little bit. There's the BRAF and MEK inhibitors, such as trimatinib, uh, vemurafenib, and rafapenib. There's also PD-1 inhibitors like Keytruda that you may have heard about more recently on the news. Pembrolizumab is the other name for it, and Optivo. There's PD-L1 inhibitors, which are uh, now under active uh, investigation and use in trials. There's also a therapy, injection therapy called TVEC or Imligec. And this is where we take a uh, herpes simplex virus that we attenuate, we break it up, we inject it into an area where a patient has a metastatic melanoma lesion. And that uh, antigen expression on the um, herpes simplex virus gets an immune response and the body begins to attack that herpes simplex, but also attacks the surrounding melanomas as well. So you get not only response to the injection, you get all the melanoma sites nearby get a uh, response to the immune system. So very exciting for local therapy. Doesn't have much to do with systemic th uh, therapy or long-term survival. And again, there are ongoing trials always about melanoma where uh, vaccinations are trying to be obtained where pa the patient's the tumor is emulsified um, and then ground up and then injected back into the patient so that the antigen would be expressed and your immune system could um, actually identify identify it. So we also are now, uh, just to remind you, are looking at systemic therapy for even earlier stages, even before you have node positivity. And the FDA just recently approved pembrolizumab for stages 2B and 2C uh, last December. So again, we are seeing um, this immunotherapy being used earlier in the uh, st uh, stages of melanoma. I think it's a very exciting time. All these medications do have some toxicity as though, and oftentimes you'll see breakthrough um, recurrences uh, and oftentimes multiple therapies will need to be used and therefore multiple toxicities have to be endured. So again, to remind you today, chemotherapy and radiation therapy have a really very little impact on survival or local control for melanoma. This is a quick um, overview uh, of the current treatments. Yervoy or Ipimilab is again a inhibition of the CTLA-4 expression on the, on the T cell when the antigen representing cell has this B7 receptor attached to the uh, CD28 receptor on the T cell, um, that's what causes the, the T cell to stop having a response. So it stops fighting the cancer cells. So uh, you want to eventually restart that immune system again. So if you make a antibody against that attachment of the B7 to the CD28 uh, link, then the T cell starts to proliferate and will be able to identify the melanoma and then start fighting the melanoma. Again, when you unleash the immune system, though, there are some side effects of it, which makes it uh, sometimes come somewhat toxic. More recently, we were looking more at the PD-1 and the PD-1 um, antigens, the PD-L1 antigens and inhibitors of those uh, uh, receptors. And the uh, PD-1 is on the T cell, the PD-L1 is on the tumor cell. And if you def it, um, it can uh, make antibodies against the uh, receptors on either the T cell side, which would be the PD-1, or on the tumor cell side, which would be the PD-L1, then you can stop that interaction and the shutting down of the immune system. And that would allow the immune system then to upregulate and start working again to, um, to help fight the immune, to help fight the melanoma. So again, our more recent advanced treatment of melanoma has been based on these NGS technology-based multiple gene panels. We are looking for actionable mutations that we can identify where we can actually target the treatment of melanoma based upon what mutation the patient might have. So it's a big game changer. You aren't just treating every melanoma the same. You're actually trying to figure out what mutations does that melanoma demonstrate and is there some type of medication that we can use, such as a BRAF inhibitor, a MEK inhibitor, or for those um, rarer forms, like you know the, the ones we talked about are the less likely to be the triple negative, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been very effective. Sometimes it does require multiple combinations of these medications. And the reason that is is because melanoma is one of the most mutagenic cancers uh, that we find in our research. Uh, that means that the cancer itself is constantly going mutations at a high rate. And so there's a high tumor mutational burden. So as these cancers mutate, 
they find ways to overcome the medication pathway that you are um, trying to block and to, to reignite the immune system. And so oftentimes you'll see recurrences after what is considered a successful response, and so you'll get a recurrent. So it may be necessary that we actually attack multiple pathways in melanoma in order to see a long uh, enduring, um, uh, basically, suppression of tumor occurrence or systemic disease. So again, very, very uh, active area of research is melanoma. And so with that, I will, uh, <laughs> is a question and answer period where you can uh, uh, basically send questions to me if you have any about this uh, presentation, but it's a very exciting area of research right now in melanoma. And certainly we are beginning to see the benefits of that research and that for the first time in a long time, we are seeing patients with melanoma having long-term survivals, even when they have positive nodes or more systemic uh, spread. So with that, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Nevada Cancer Coalition in particular uh, for the opportunity to talk about skin cancers and, and in melanoma in particular. And again, the collaboration between the Nevada Cancer Coalition uh, with the uh, University of Nevada Reno uh, School of Medicine, Renowned Health and other community partners, American Cancer Society have really uh, benefited this area there's lots of uh, uh, work being done on uh, skin cancer prevention uh, by the Best Cancer Coalition, including SunSmart program, which is targeting our schools and trying to educate our students and our teachers about the um, evils of UV, excess of UV radiation, and also uh, trying to get the word out how important it is to uh, really limit your sun exposure and to avoid tanning booths, particularly at the very young age. So with that, I appreciate your time and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. That was wonderfully informative and I'm sure will be widely watched. Great. <laughs>